introduce our amazing panel. I'm starting with Jared uh, because, after all, he's a minority on this panel. <laughs> so we wanted to give him the privilege of being introduced first so to make him feel at home. Um, so along with his younger brother, Ryan, and their father, Scott, Jared co-founded Qualtrics, the platform that allows organizations to collect, understand, and take meaningful action on experience data. And they just sold it to Jen Morgan and SAP for the bargain price of $8 billion. <laughs> uh, before he did that, Ryan went to the London School of Economics, worked for Google, and when one of his first companies was sold to Microsoft, I love the fact that he spent a year hitchhiking around South America, and his trip included 82 buses, 11 boats, 19 airplanes, four cars, seven jeeps, 11 canoes, and 32 border crossings, which got him thinking about experience, no doubt. <laughs> I hope getting to San Diego was easier. <laughs> Jen is a member of SAP's executive board President for the Americas and Asia Pacific Japan, the regions she oversees encompass over 43,000 SAP employees and nearly 230,000 customers. Um, Jen is also our partner at Thrive Global, and I'm so delighted you are here. Marvel Sullivan Berthold is a healthcare expert who, among other things, was the kind of inspiration and uh, the um, actual implementer of the initiative that JP Morgan made with Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon to start solving some of the healthcare problems that their companies and others are having. Before that, she was at Novartis, and as good fortune would have it, to have her here with us today, right at the beginning of our Thrive Index journey, and she has a lot to say about that. <laughs> and finally, Marcy Frost is the CEO of the California Public Employees Retirement System, uh, best known as CalPERS. She's the ninth CEO and only the second woman. <laughs> um, she started working as a 12-year-old and is the daughter of a teen mother. Uh, she's really worked her way into the American dream and she also got the job that launched her career because of an emergency need the, her office had for a second baseman for their softball team. <laughs> yes. So I think that, Marcy, your skill set is probably the widest one in this, <laughs> on this panel. So, Jared, let me start with you. You've been uh, sitting next to Jen, and we've been talking um, backstage about all that you are doing together. But explain to us what are the X data and the O data, experience data or operational data? And what is the magic that is created when you bring these two sets of data together? It's, um, it's a great question, and it, it comes to the, you know, the core of why Qualtrics was, uh, it was so valuable to um, SAP. So let me um, illustrate with a, with a simple example, and I'll, I'll go to a disinterested one a, a way back in time that's somewhat health-related. Um, but if you go back to 1994, you had, in the weeks before Christmas, Delta Airlines slip out a press release saying, starting on January 1st, they are going to end smoking on all of their airplanes. <laughs> and the minute that that release hit, Wall Street went wild and their stock crashed. How could you be an airline and exclude the smokers? But what no one knew, and this is long before internet bookings, is that their call center phones went off the, off the hook. They couldn't handle all of the incoming calls. And so that simple adjustment boosted the revenue so extreme that within two quarters, every airline in the US followed suit. So what did Delta know that others didn't know? Well, the first is that we operate our, our businesses on O data largely. Most of the world does this. And this is all of your operational systems that basically tell you what's happening inside the walls of your business. And when these systems emerged in the 80s and the, and the management uh, director, uh, uh, theorist Peter Drucker was asked about them, what he said was that computerization is greatly overrated and it's not going to be as transformative as people think because it's just going to make the organizations a lot more efficient. 
So if you take airlines, that's a great case in point. They know how to optimize the routing tables, uh, the yield capacity, the pricing. They had mastered that. And everyone was competing, and they had a formula for how you wanted to grow your revenue. X data is the stuff that happens outside the walls of your business. And what Delta tapped into was they figured out that people were sick of going, I want an aisle or a window seat, and how far can you get me away from the smokers? And then they took their O data, which is the frequent flyer information, and said, actually, the people who hate the smokers the most are the people who fly and spend more money with us. And those two pieces of insight, the operational data, which customers are the most important, with the X data of what are their preferences, combined for a unique insight that actually didn't cost them money, it saved them money. Because less cleaning on the planes and everything else, and it propelled their business. So what is X and O data? It's very simple. The O data is all the operational data that you have today. The X data is everyone that you're serving and what's happening and what they really think. And the power of those two is game changing. So Jen, how is the Thrive Index XM going to take that amazing mm -hmm. story that Jared just recounted and bring the experience data and the operational data together in the interest of companies? So Jared gave a great example of experience management and how it affects consumers and, and the business. If you think about what everybody is trying to do today, every company, they're trying to identify their own experience gap before somebody else steps into it. And it's the same thing when you're thinking about your business as when you think about your people, right? If you don't understand the gaps that exist in your employees' experiences, somebody else will exploit that. Your employees will leave. And so for us, we, we look at traditional measures. We look at engagement. We look at trust. We look at a point in time. And this world is changing so much. Companies are constantly changing so much. And people's opinions are very fluid. And so for us, the index is not a set of kind of yesterday's measures or a point in time. It's about how can you look at a certain set of experiences that will really define what we were going to really reframe as wellness. Wellness is, yes, it's about health. But health can be defined in a lot of different ways financial wellness, your career wellness, and understanding the experiences that happen across those different categories, we believe will allow companies to better take their X data, understand their O data, understand why certain things are happening, and use that index almost as a leading indicator to the financial results. Because if you do that really well, you're going to understand where that experience shows up on your income statement. And so that's what we're all about with the index and with our companies in the workforce. So, Marvel, you've been talking a lot about what is missing in healthcare mm -hmm. outcomes because more and more companies are talking about facilitating um, human experiences, valuing their human capital. But clearly, healthcare outcomes are not really improving. In fact, healthcare costs are rising, um, life uh, span is falling and chronic diseases are rising. So what's missing? What's the gap? You know, after we announced the J.P. Morgan initiative with Amazon and Berkshire, I had the opportunity to sit with hundreds, I mean, honestly, maybe thousands of companies, politicians, startups, big, in healthcare, not in healthcare, and everyone was talking about, this is what's wrong, this is what's broken, here's this, here's that. And looking on it, having lived in Switzerland for a long time, and just seeing where we are in the US, said so actually what's missing, we have organized demand, we have superior supply, we do have great products, like technology has now, I think as we can see with the people in the audience, has come into healthcare. We've got the superior supply, we've got this organized demand, it's not linking, because no one is solving around or for desire. Companies are throwing these products at people, saying you get $500 for this, here's this app. But there has been no concerted effort to actually say, how do we get these people to want this? If it existed, I mean, we have so many apps that control so many things and it's not working because it's not indispensable. So 
if you think about it, there are industries that have made their products, have had to make their products indispensable. And that has been a real missing link and that no one's really thought, what do people actually want? How do we get them to engage and make that the organizing principle? Because it's better if they engage in something rather than this perfection of what we build, like that saying, you know, I'm a leader, where are my followers? I have this app, why aren't people using it? Well, it's not very good. Nobody wants to, it's confusing. And so the thing I've kind of come upon is that I think we've got a lot of good things going on, but we've got to make people want it. We've got to help them want it and understand it. Um, employees, even myself, again, I see a lot of stuff and no one really knows that it's out there, that it's for them, how to use it. Because everyone's building things for each other, not for the end user. You've said something to me that kind of summed up what you are saying, which is, how does the fashion industry create demand for a $2,000 Prada bag that, pe Prada bag that people who make $50,000 feel they have to buy? How can we create uh, the, the desire and the demand for what is actually good for people? Maybe, Marcy, you have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> because <only>. actually, <laughs> Um, you have a portfolio of $350 billion. You are the second largest buyer of healthcare after the US government. Mm -hmm. So you're at this intersection of employee experience, customer experience, healthcare outcomes. Yep. What do you think has been missing? So for CalPERS, and for those of you who don't know, CalPERS is really more known for our $350 billion portfolio than for the fact that we're the second largest health purchaser besides the federal government. And what we've been thinking about lately is how do we connect these three, and actually we, we run a 2,800 employee organization as well, but how do we better connect the investment side of what we're doing to the healthcare outcomes that we're trying to accomplish? Because what we're trying to accomplish on the healthcare side is a balance between quality and cost. Because the public employers, and we um, have a mission that's very important to us, we serve those who serve California, uh, they have an option of whether they purchase their health care from CalPERS or whether they purchase their health care from somewhere else. So we always have to keep in mind that that balance of quality and cost is really imperative. The other side of the coin is really the pension side, and the pension side to us is employee benefits. And the liability stream is out for decades. And there are times that healthcare is working against pensions. So the longer people live, the longer they draw a benefit, which means the liabilities on the pension side become more problematic. But one of the options that we have been uh, exploring, and some of you may have seen this in recent press coverage, we get a lot of press coverage, is how do we take it more advantage of the fact that people are living longer. California has a little bit different experience, I think, than the rest of the US, but people in California are living longer. So how can we invest to better match those liabilities? And one way that we want to do that is to look more upstream. Look upstream, late stage venture, primarily in life science, biotech sectors, and how do we invest in those companies that are really going to make a difference on the healthcare side, the breakthrough side, if you will, and really help us manage the pension obligations in a better way to the healthcare obligations. So that would just be one example of what we're looking at. So Marcy, all and all of you, whoever wants to take that, all of us know that the employee well-being and taking care of our human capital is not a nice to have. It's not kind of a warm and fuzzy HR benefit. It's uh, absolutely essential and it's a business imperative. Mm -hmm. So we know that, we talk about it, but how can we actually manifest it as a reality in every company beyond you know, the rhetoric? So I think it has to be measured. Uh, what we've found is if you measure it, it gets managed. we found ways to measure our, our culture and the outcomes that we're trying to accomplish. Again, we, we have about 2,800 employees around the state of California, but what's more important is that we're representing two million members. We're protecting their pension benefits, or we're protecting one and a half million covered lives. So we found a way to measure some of the health outcomes, and an example there would be um, we have a very large data warehouse. We look at the data and we use that data to inform innovation and we use that data to inform our rate negotiation cycle. And what we were finding is that um, opioid duration was 
entering um, ranges that we were just not comfortable with. So we decided that we were going to put a lot of transparency around that issue for us. We put it into our performance management system. It goes before our board on a quarterly basis and gets broadcast everywhere. But what we found in that data, and by putting more transparency and attention, management attention, if you will, we found that the opioid duration has reduced by 30% over the last two years. And I think, again, what gets uh, measured gets managed is a philosophy that we have. Uh, the next two pieces would be around uh, diabetes and um, obesity. Those would be the two areas that we'll be adding over the next quarter um, or two. And Jen, what are some of the examples of uh, investing in your people that you've adopted at SAP, and what impact has it had on the business? I think when you have a, you know, when you have a, a big company and you have a lot of people, it's really easy to kind of take a macro approach to everything. And I love the example um, that Ryan and Jared had at Qualtrics, which was around, in this case, maternity leave. And a lot of times we, we make an assumption that by providing more leave and being more generous and, and really investing in that, that, that this is going to be a good thing. And what, what Ryan found in talking to the different um, people who would return from maternity leave is everybody wanted something different. Some people wanted to take all that time you know, right up front. Other people wanted to be able to come back, spend time, maybe several months later. And you know, you said it great backstage, like parenting is, doesn't just happen when a child's born and you go on a maternity leave. And so really understanding that segment of one. Every, every company is focused on going direct to their consumer. We have to go direct to our employees and understand every, everybody wants a little something different. So from our perspective, when you've got almost 100,000 employees, you have to do that, and that means you have to constantly pulse and measure, because to your point, otherwise all you're doing is kind of building the, the something that you hope they'll come to. And many times people think a lot differently um, than what the O data might be telling you, right? What that operational data tells you. And many times as leaders, we're far away sometimes from what's happening you know, down on the ground. And understanding that X data all the time is really changing, I think, um, the game here. So for the Thrive Index, we've divided employee experiences into five. Yes. Uh, career, family, financial, time. And health. And health. So part of what that means is that we're looking at the whole human. We're not just looking at the person who shows up at work, right. because every part of your human experience is affecting how you show up at work. Yes. So of all these five, um, Jared, what do you think has been most neglected? Or what do you think we should be focusing more attention on than we are? I, um, I actually think all of them. And I'll like, explain it because I think our, our approach is fundamentally wrong, which is if, if you take benefits in general, we look at benefits as a package that we cost optimize and we push out to employees and, and say, here we go. But in reality, that's just the old way of doing it, which is all based on the O data, as opposed to actually talking to the employees about what, what matters. So um, I'll give two e examples of this. So the, the first, I'll, I'll carry on with, um, with the example Jen gave, that it really, if you think of those benefits as a series of experiences, you'll get to the right outcome. So what is your sick experience for the company? And what will employees experience when they are sick? What is the um, parenting experience? So if we go back to maternity, the old benefit way is here's your maternity package, we'll see you in three months. Well, parenting, as Jen said, does not end when they come back in three months. And when you talk to the employees, what you find out is that three months might be too long. What they probably want is to come back in two and a half months and then have two of the remaining two weeks be flexible that, hey, if, if today's a day they need to spend with the newborn, and they're feeling that that need, that they have the flexibility to do it. And in that, it doesn't cost the business anymore. Mm -hmm. Same amount of expense and leave. It actually accelerates revenue because productive employees are coming back. And then it's just delivering it over time. But it doesn't map to that old way of here's your benefits package. And so if you break the entire employee experience into individual experiences, what's your leave experience? Um, it gets you to a much better uh, answer because you can optimize each of those discrete parts. One other example, um, when I was at, at Google early on, we famously launched the 20% time. And what isn't widely known is that most employees never participated in it. 
and that it was actually 140% time. So you've got your regular job that's working you 60 hours a week, and then you layer on top your extra, extracurricular. But if we tee off what, what you were saying about people living longer, which therefore translates into careers being longer, there's the reality that we all need to retool as we go along. And so as we were looking at the career experience inside of Qualtrics, it became very obvious to us that it wasn't 20% time that was needed, but that all employees should have 10% of their time to learn and to retool. And so we're in the process of launching this to, uh, to great success of, hey, take two days every month and invest in yourself. And that's a commitment we're making to you, and we know that if you're investing in yourself that it will pay back to us. Very non-traditional benefit, but it came out of analyzing the discrete uh, uh, parts and saying, what will the experience be for a career here at Qualtrics? And Thank you so much, Jared. That really explains it. And now I would love to go to the audience. Any questions? Uh, we have mic runners who will come to you. Please stand, introduce yourself, and ask a question of someone in particular of, or, or of all of us. If you don't have a question, I have plenty here. Oh, no, we have a question in the back there. Hi, this is uh, Kelly Roman from Fisher Wallace. Um, I, I guess it, it, what's striking me from this conversation is it, instead of trying to push a product, maybe the, you know, the, the first thing you should do is, is ask your customers some questions. And I, <laughs> I guess if you could mm -hmm. just kind of elaborate on that mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, from, say, an e-commerce model, uh, instead of pushing something, you ask first. Mm -hmm. is, is, that, is, that, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. And from my perspective and, and just some experience is you really have to work to understand the needs and the expectation of your customer base before you determine which products to deliver. And what typically happens is this choice overload that can happen if you don't filter through and, and really kind of be this good housekeeping seal of approval, if you will, for your members or for your customers. And so what we've started to do is try to really be direct about understanding customer needs, customer expectations as it relates to the services that we provide at CalPERS, and then get very focused on delivering only those. Right? So that helps with the cost containment, but it also helps up our customer satisfaction scores. And maybe just an example of that. If you look at, I mean, I'll talk to employer spend. If you look at employer spend, 70% of it sits in maternity, musculoskeletal, and mental illness. I mean, we talk about a lot of different things, but if you're an employer, the fact that someone's even working is ruling out a lot of different kinds of diseases. So you take those three M's and you say, that's where my cost is, but it's also where people are getting some pretty dramatic experiences on movement, which is musculoskeletal, maternity having a child, which we've talked about. I think that's a big pressing need, and also mental health. Those are three kind of life things, and they don't even sit in a, a true sickness bucket. Like, yes, but it's things we all need to maintain. Why don't we think in terms of organizing around that and packaging that up into primary care? Because if people really, really did primary care and worked through these and had relationships, it would all be better. And no one thinks like that. They think in very siloed ways, often around the therapeutic area, which is how the drug industry has organized it. But these are just the examples, looking where is the need, what are people using, and how can I really get there? It's just basic consumer. Healthcare just self-selects out of a consumer mindset because the organization, and the, it's all been B2B for so long. So we have less than two minutes left. Some final thoughts from everyone. Final thoughts. So it's really about culture, uh, at least from my perspective. And it's not just about the culture at CalPERS. It's about the culture of the companies in which we invest. So what we do is we try to understand that culture. We need those companies to be sustainable and thriving uh, for, for decades to match our liabilities. So I think more attention to factors other than quarterly financial returns um, is something that I think we should all have a better voice around. Um, I would say. Many people out here represent really great products. Uh, think of ways to make them indispensable. Companies used to give out Blackberries, and the iPhone was so great, you had people go out and buy a second phone. Mm -hmm. That's how we should be thinking about healthcare. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we're excited about the index, and um, you've heard a little bit about it today, but we'd love to get your feedback and have you join us and, and give us your feedback on the experiences, and we'd love to share the ones that, that we've really defined as the ones that become what we believe will be the leading indicators to, um, to great results on many fronts. So fortune.com um, slash thrive XM. <laughs> Had to give that, you know. Great, I love push. that. <laughs> Perfect. You are making it indispensable. You are following Marvel's advice. That's right. Actionable. Actionable. I would just say that the thing that strikes me the most is that um, if if I look around the room and uh, and think most of us didn't start our careers this year, and if we look back and think about <laughs> how much has changed over the 20 or so years that we've been working. Yeah. The world is not the same, and the pace at which it's evolving is so fast that if, you, if we don't move from a, mm -hmm. hey, business is normal mindset to a mindset of we define the experiences that we're looking to offer and then to the question that was asked, we figure out how to measure them. We get a benchmark in that says, hey, this is you know, how we're doing today. We figure out how to prioritize what's most important to change it, and then we begin that constant optimization. If we don't do that, then we're not going to end up in a good place and we're going to be left behind. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ariana.